everybody, welcome to an exciting chemistry video lesson. Today we're going to focus our attention on atomic structure, isotopes, and ions. Okay, so let's get right into it. Uh, hopefully you uh, know something about atoms. If not, we're going to kind of go into the little background and the basics of them. Um, atoms are the essential building blocks of the chemistry that we're going to be doing. Um, so this starts with Dalton's atomic theory. Uh, so atoms are the smallest components of an element having same uh, the same chemical properties of that particular element. So for example, if you have a sample of carbon, uh, that would be all carbon, nothing else in it, it would be a element of carbon. Well, if you break it down to the smallest piece possible that retains the property and the essence of carbon, that would be considered the atom. So it's breaking it down to the smallest piece that still retains the properties of that particular element. Now this was uh, thought up way back in ancient times, but it wasn't until 1803 uh, that Dalton, John Dalton, an English uh, teacher, uh, actually came up with a theory uh, revolving around uh, atoms, and it's referred to as his, as his atomic theory. So he has four postulates to his, atom, his atomic theory, um, and the first one was that all matter is made up of extremely small, indivisible particles called atoms. So he kind of thought of them as little tiny spheres uh, that were impossible to break down. So you could take something and keep breaking it in half, breaking it in half, breaking it in half, until you got down to this little tiny indivisible undividable uh, particle called the atom. He said that all atoms of the same element are identical in mass and properties. So the red one here is oxygen and the white ones are hydrogen atoms. Well these two atoms are not the same because they're different elements. So hydrogen atoms would be the same. So if I had two different uh, hydrogen atoms, according to Dalton's atomic theory, these two atoms would be exactly the same, but yet they would be different from the oxygen atoms. So they're gonna have different properties, they're gonna have different masses, and they're gonna react differently uh, when we combine them together. Third, he said that when we make compounds, two or more atoms combined together. So if we take this um, hydrogen atom, we can go ahead and combine it with the oxygen atom. So when these atoms come together, they can create a new compound. Okay, so when we have two or more atoms joined together, we can do something like create water molecules. So two hydrogens and one oxygen combine together to make a water molecule. Uh, and number four is that a chemical reaction occurs when those atoms are rearranging. So as I was moving those atoms around and combining them in different fashion, that would be classified as a chemical reaction. So this is the very basic fundamental um, concept in chemistry, and it's really, really helpful to this day uh, to use Dalton's atomic theory. Now the problem is there are a few things that are not completely correct with this, but it's okay because when we deal with chemistry, and what I just did there is the only little demonstration, is ultimately true, pretty true as far as the way the, the atoms come together to make the molecules and compounds that we're going to deal with. It's really it. But when we get down to the nitty gritty parts, we're going to see that there are some things that pop up and that are, are going to happen in this. So what scientists did after Dalton came up with this postulate, this idea of the atomic theory, was they started to, to see if they could take the atom apart. And that was the first mistake in his work. I guess not a mistake, but just he just didn't know because of the time he was in, 1803. So around 1897, almost, you know, almost 100 years later, scientists started picking apart the atom, and they first discovered the electron, then they discovered the nucleus, and they discovered protons and neutrons. Um, but essentially, the atom is made up of three subatomic particles. Protons, which I'll use the symbol notation here to, to denote uh, protons when I write them, uh, neutrons, and electrons, and again, the various symbols I'll be using. Um, so when we look at protons and neutrons, they have almost an identical mass. Their masses are almost exactly the same. There is a slight variation if you keep going with the, the decimal places in the number, but for the most part, protons and neutrons have pretty much the same mass. Now, if we look at electrons, they are very small compared to those two particles. Now, it doesn't look like it when you write it in this format, but the uh, you know that's, that's a difference of about you know, a thousand different uh, in mass when you actually compare the different uh, the particles there. So instead of dealing with the masses in grams, which is a little difficult because it's such a small number, scientists came up with a scale called the atomic mass unit, 
which is AMU. And I go into that in a little more detail in a video lesson later on on isotopes and average atomic masses. But for, the, for right now, the relative mass just means that the masses of the protons and neutrons are about the same, so therefore we're going to give them a notation of 1. Now the electron, because it's so much smaller in mass than the other two, it's 1,840th of the mass of a proton and a neutron. So what we can do with that is we can actually say that the mass of an electron is ultimately zero when we compare it to the other two particles. It's going to be so small in mass that it's not really going to have any effect on the mass of the atom. Uh, and then there's charges. The protons carry a charge of plus one. The neutron doesn't have a charge at all. That's why it's called a neutron for neutral. And the electron has a minus charge. So those are the, the, the notations there. So the atom, as they discovered more and more about it, they found that the atom is composed of two parts, the nucleus and the electrons. Okay. So what they found in the nucleus is where the protons and the neutrons are going to be found. So if you think about that, the nucleus is really uh, a positively charged center of the atom and it is extremely small and it contains a lot of the mass so as a result of that that mass all the mass of the atom is compacted into a very 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 small uh, center now they don't really represent it in this model like that because you couldn't see it too well but that would be the idea that this would be really really small somewhere in the center of the atom now the electrons are somewhere on the outside now they typically show them in these rings like this and pictures and drawings we're gonna get into a lot more detail in some future video lessons on where those electrons are and how they're moving around and what's going on because there's a lot of mystery to those um, so there's somewhere outside of the, the 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 atom for I'm sorry outside of the nucleus as of this rate as of <laughs> as of right now, sorry. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to the next section, which would be on what the property of each of the particles does. So the protons, the function of the proton is it gives the element its identity and properties. So that's what makes each element unique. Each element has its own unique number of protons. So hydrogen is the only element on the periodic table that carries one proton in its nucleus. If you add another proton to it, then you change it from hydrogen to helium and so on and so forth and carbon is going to have six protons and that's unique to carbon so no other element in the universe is going to have six protons now to distinguish this scientists call this the atomic number the atomic number tells you how many protons there are now in most periodic tables you're going to see this kind of setup and you're going to see the symbol for the element and you will also see the uh, atomic number okay and the atomic number is usually on the top on the bottom is the average atomic mass so we're going to get to that in a future lesson we'll talk about where that that comes from uh, but for right now don't worry about that we're just focusing on the atomic number and the neutrons and stuff so neutrons what the neutron does is it basically determines the type of isotope you deal with and I'm going to talk about isotopes in just a second so certain elements can have certain numbers of neutrons and we'll get into the various isotopes the electron basically controls the chemical properties and this is really important for us we're going to focus a lot of attention on the electrons that is the most important part of the atom for us because we're going to talk a lot about chemical reactions and chemical properties so that's going to deal with how the electron moves around so when the electron since it's on the outside of the atom those electrons can be gained or lost and what that is going to do is it's going to create what are called ions so uh, protons give the identity neutrons basically control the isotopes and electrons control the chemical properties so let's look at two of these in a little more detail let's start with isotopes so each atom has a um, there are various isotopes of each atom. So the other problem that Dalton had uh, with his postulates is that he said that each atom of hydrogen would be exactly the same. Well, when scientists discovered more about the atom, they realized, well, not really. They're not really exactly the same. But for us, to be honest, since they all have the same number of electrons, they're all going to react chemically the same way. So for us, the fact that there's isotopes isn't going to have a huge impact on what we do, uh, but it does have a small impact that we'll see in a future lesson. So for right now, now, each isotope, there's three of them for hydrogen, hydrogen 1, hydrogen 2, hydrogen 3. So what they're doing here is they're coming up with this little number to distinguish between the three isotopes. That's what's referred to as the mass number. The mass number is the sum of the number of protons and the neutrons in the nucleus. So there's one proton, so hydrogen 1. Proton and a neutron, 
hydrogen 2 and you can see here that there's two neutrons and one proton so therefore hydrogen 3 so that's referred to as the mass number now don't get confused because the mass number is not the true mass of the atom all it is really doing is it's counting the particles uh, and if you're using the relative mass then you could say that it's counting it but remember the actual mass is a little bit different and again I'm going to go into more detail on this in the future lesson on um, average atomic mass which I'll have a link in the uh, description below for you if you want to take a look at that. Okay, so the mass number is really just used to distinguish between various isotopes. So if I say hydrogen 3, we all know that I'm talking about this particular isotope of hydrogen and not the hydrogen 1. Now the way we write this, there's three different ways scientists can write this, uh, you know, so that we can talk about the different isotopes. There's this notation here where they write out the word fully, or they use the symbol, and then they put a number after it. And the number after is always going to be the mass number, so it's the sum of the protons and the neutrons. They also use this notation here, which is called the isotopic notation, and the A represents the mass number, Z would be our atomic number, and X would be the chemical symbol. Okay, So if I had hydrogen 3, I would write hydrogen, I would write a 1 down here for the atomic number, and I would write a 3 here. Okay, we're going to use this notation a lot later on in uh, nuclear chemistry. So when we get, when you start watching those videos on nuclear chemistry, you're going to see this come back up. So in future lessons, you're going to want to know this notation, and I'll remind you what it is when we get to that. Okay, so let's take a look at one other section here, which is on ions. Now, because the electrons can move in and out of the atom, well, they're going to create what are called ions. And so if you think about it, the electron has a negative charge and the proton has a positive charge. So if I have an equal number of protons and electrons, then I have a neutral atom. The atom would have an equal number of charges. They cancel out. One plus or minus one gives you a zero charge. Okay, so if the atom has an uh, extra number of protons than it does electrons, then it will carry a positive charge. So you get a positive charge for those and we call those cations. Okay? Not cations, but cations. And if the opposite effect, if we have more electrons than we do protons, then the atom is going to carry a negative charge. So we get a negative charge based on having more electrons because obviously if you have three electrons and two protons, you're going to get a negative charge. These are called uh, anions. Not anions, but anions. So when ions form, um, the number of protons has to change. Because remember, the protons dictate what the element is. So if I have something like uh, element, you know, sodium, Na, okay, it's going to have 11 protons and 11 electrons. So its protons are going to be equal to 11, and electrons are going to be equal to to 11. Now I can't change the protons because if I change the protons I change the element. It would no longer be sodium. So therefore only the electrons are going to be switching back and forth. And if you think about the structure of the atom because electrons are on the outside it makes sense that these are going to be lost first before those protons will be. So what I have here is sodium and if the protons stay the same and I go ahead and I lose an electron and I end up with 10 electrons left over then I would have a positive charge for sodium. And this is how we would write this. We would write the sodium with a positive charge in the top right-hand corner. So the right-hand corner on the upper right-hand corner is where we put the charges, okay? So if sodium tends to have a positive one, then we would have uh, calcium has a positive two, uh, sulfurs tend to form a minus two, and so on and so forth, okay? All right, so let's put this all together. Now you know enough uh, about protons, neutrons, and electrons, and if all you had is a periodic table uh, and a little more information, you would be able to figure out exactly how many protons, neutrons, and electrons are in any of the isotopes that are given to you. So let's just pick uh, nitrogen, okay? So if we have nitrogen, okay, and I give you nitrogen 14, okay? So remember, this number here is going to be the atom or the mass number, okay? So that's our mass number. Okay, so if I have the nitrogen, I can figure out how many protons are in nitrogen because I know where it's at on the periodic table and the number above tells me the atomic number. Remember, the atomic number is the number of protons, so it has seven protons. Now, since I know that the mass number is 14, I can figure out the number of neutrons because remember, the mass number is the sum of the protons plus the neutrons, which would be seven. 
Then if I want to figure out the electrons, the electrons are going to be, now since this has no charge in the upper right hand corner, it's going to be equal to the number of protons. So therefore I would have seven. So seven protons, seven neutrons, seven electrons. Now let's say we look at nitrogen with a minus three charge, an ion of nitrogen. Now I would still need to know that it's nitrogen 14 because I need to know what the mass number is and that's the problem the periodic table does not give you the mass number so it does not distinguish between the various isotopes so anytime you're doing this you have to be given the mass number or somehow you have to know what the number of neutrons are and to be honest we really aren't going to care too much about the number of neutrons as we progress because they don't really have much of an effect other than uh, the mass Okay, so this is still going to have seven protons because it's nitrogen. Uh, the neutrons are still going to be seven because it's a mass number of 14 still. And my electrons are going to have, since there's a minus three here, I'm going to have now three less electrons, so therefore it will be four. So now I can determine the number of electrons based on the charge. Okay, now if you notice on the periodic table, I drew some charges on here. These are called the common ions, or the, the most common ions of these elements. So the, the halogens, or sorry, halogens, the alkali metals are going to always have a plus one. Now again, later in a future lesson, I'm going to get more into detail on the periodic table and talk about what the names of the periodic table columns are and where all this stuff comes from. But for right now, so we can work with some basic stuff, we need to know that column one, okay is going to always carry a positive one charge okay I'll have a link to a periodic table and if you want to write this down on your periodic table that would be great so you can include this charge at the top of your uh, column so every element here potassium will always make a positive one ion or it will be neutral one of the two so as it is on the periodic table it's neutral so 19 protons 19 electrons but if I use it in a reaction it could lose or gain electrons in this case it'll lose it and become a positive one magnesium will be a magnesium 2 plus it will lose two electrons to become magnesium or it could be neutral rarely will ever make a three or a four or anything like that we're going to skip these for right now and again in a future lesson I'll get into those silvers tend to be a positive one zincs and cadmium tend to be a plus two uh, the uh, boron family here would be a positive three so these elements here now boron typically doesn't form a charge but aluminum and the elements down do form a charge so those would be three plus three minus for the nitrogens, two minus for the oxygen family, and one minus for the fluorine family, which are called the halogens. These are your noble gases. They're not going to carry a charge at all, and we'll get into all that stuff later on. So don't worry about the why right now. For right now, we're just looking at what uh, typical charges we're going to be working with. Okay, so minus three, minus two, minus one. Notice here that the nonmetals, the right side of the periodic table, tends to form negative charges, while the left side tends to form the positive charges. And again, there's reasons for all of that. So hold on, and we'll get to all that as we progress through the lessons. All right, so I think that's enough for today. Uh, I hope that's enough information to get you started. And if you have any questions, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks.